Welcome to today's dialogue sponsored by the League of Revolutionaries for a New America on Take Back Our Cities. My name is Liz Gonzalez and my pronouns are she and her. Your uh, moderator, Liz Gonzalez, is from East San Jose and the daughter of immigrant parents. She began organizing in high school around issues of racial justice and education with Californians for Justice. She's a co-founder of Silicon Valley Debug, a nationally recognized organizing and media collective, working as media editor and organizing around workers' rights, immigration issues, against police violence, and housing justice issues. She was a leader of Silicon Valley Renters' Rights Coalition from 2015 to 2019, and is the incorporator and board president of South Bay Community Land Trust. Thank you, Sandy. And my co-moderator um, for maybe the first hour, maybe more, is Sandy Perry. Uh, Sandy has been organizing side by side with tenants and unhoused people for 30 years in San Jose, California. He is currently a volunteer with CHAM Deliverance Ministry, the Affordable Housing Network, and the South Bay Community Land Trust. We encourage you to put your pronouns uh, into your profile as a participant. Um, the, the League uh, believes that gender and sexual liberation is part of our work to free society of cis heteropatriarchy, which is deeply intertwined with white supremacy and other forms of oppression. We also encourage all of you, post links in the chat to your campaigns, the struggles that you are involved in, or important organizations that you're part of to allow us to be able to share in your work and in your wisdom. We're just gonna go over some community agreements. I'll post them in the chat also so folks can read along um, if you'd like to. And we just request that you observe these in today's dialogue. Everyone is muted in the beginning and must unmute themselves in order to talk. We encourage you to put questions in the chat during the presentations. Panelists will have a chance to discuss them, um, time permitting. There will be an opportunity to ask verbal questions during our Q&As, but we request that if your internet connection might be bad, to please stick to the chat. Um, Zoom etiquette is for us to remain muted when we're not talking, to keep the noise down. And in the spirit of political unity, please listen and practice respect and kindness, including in the chat. Um, and please do your best to not mispronounce, mispronoun participants and make space for all voices. I was asked to do a, a land acknowledgement and I'm speaking from San Jose, California. So I'll, I'll speak uh, about our situation here in San Jose. The city of San Jose would like to recognize it is located on the ethno-historic territory of the ancestral and unceded land of the Tanyan Ohlone speaking tribal groups of the greater Santa Clara Valley, which includes the lands of the Alsans, Matalans, and Palenos, whose tribal region was named after their powerful chief, Capitan Pala, and the two Mexican land grants located in the East Hills above San Jose, and who were intermarried with the direct ancestors of some of the lineages en enrolled in the Muecma Ohlone tribe of San Francisco Bay Area, who were missionized into Mission Santa Clara, San Jose, and San Francisco. The Muecma Ohlone tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area is the, leaguer, is the legal successor of all the surviving Native American lineages, including the Tamian Ohlone speaking tribes who comprise the historic, sovereign, and previously federally recognized Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great spiritual and historic importance to the Moekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, it's important not to just acknowledge, but to commit to change the situation and to commit to fight for justice in the situation. And this means several things. One, uh, it means being part of the land back movement, which I know people involved in community land trusts uh, are part of that, that we take parcels of land away from corporations and restore them to the original owners 
the indigenous tribes. It also means taking land away from corporations who are using it for private property, for extraction, and for destruction of the earth, and giving it to the use of human beings for housing, for community gardens, for community agriculture, and for the use of communities all throughout the country. It's also important uh, to, to deal with the situation of, of uh, to support human beings and support people who are fighting against settler colonialism all over the world. And everyone is aware that that's happening most directly right now in Palestine, where I, I've always been a housing activist and half the housing units in Gaza have already been completely destroyed. A million and a half people have been uprooted and displaced. I think it took five years to uproot and displace a million and a half people during the Vietnam War. And this has happened in little, only a little over a month. That, that 10 to 15,000 people have been uh, murdered, many of them children. And I, I think as part of our acknowledgement, we have to uh, commit to that that situation will not continue and that we will take steps to make sure that we'll tie our fight for justice with the fight for justice for everyone all around the world. Thank you so much, Cindy. Yeah, we're in a really heavy time. So folks, you know, if you need to take a collective breath and during this Zoom, please take care of your needs. If you need to go off camera, if you need to get water, um, just make sure you're taking care of yourself. I'm gonna take a breath. You know, we're having this conversation at a really critical time. The League holds these dialogues to exchange ideas, inspire and connect folks all across the country. Like Sandy said, we're in a really horrifying world moment and we're seeing worldwide action and solidarity. Here at home, it's the same. And we're gonna probably see one of the nastiest campaign periods we've seen in a long time. And the forces against us really work to immobilize us with fear. But everyday people, folks on this Zoom call and the folks that we know, you know, are organizing and beating back all the hate field sentiment and legislation that we're seeing. We're so hopeful with the wins at the state levels, the local levels, that shows the tremendous disconnect between the people and the folks in government that are supposed to represent us. And that's why we're so excited to have folks from all across the country, from different cities, um, to hear more about those local fights, to learn about the challenges and the victories. So thank you very much to everyone for spending a little part of your Saturday with us um, and making us hopefully all better and more inspired by the time that we leave here today. Well, I'd like to um, introduce the first panelists this morning. Um, we have Ethel Long Scott and Arlene Hip, and they're speaking for the Laney College Poor People's Campaign in Oakland, California. And they're gonna discuss its participation in the United Against Hate campaign sponsored by Community for Change. For nearly 50 years, Ethel Long Scott has been a grassroots community organizer, social issues advocate, political campaign strategist, and nonprofit uh, director, primarily in the city of Oakland, California. She worked with labor, the housing insecure, Moms for Housing, the Oakland renters strike and people fighting as essential workers in health justice for poor and disabled people. She is on a mission to increase social and economic justice and economic security and works tirelessly to create opportunities for constructive social change where none seem to exist. She maintains a keen understanding of current public policy, media and politics and works cooperatively and effectively with all kinds of people across racial and class lines. Arlene Hip is a resident of Kent, Oakland by way of Brooklyn, New York. She is also a member of Laney College Poor People's Campaign 
aware I've had the pleasure of uh, meeting her at some of our meetings. And she's a client member and secretary of Bay Area Legal Aid. She's an advisory board member of Bar High Bay Area Regional Health Initiative Incorporated, a member of the East Bay Gray Panthers of Berkeley, and a member of EBHO, which is the East Bay Housing Organization, Regional Policy Committee. She lives at the intersection of housing, healthcare, economic, environmental justice, and civil rights issues. And this continues to motivate her to share information and educate her communities. She advocates for changes to all systems, policies, and laws that continue to cause harm. So welcome to Ethel and Arlene. Thank you, family. Uh, just one little correction. Um, and it's because I gave you the wrong name, but it is um, uh, Care for Communities is the primary sponsor of the um, video that we'll be sharing with you uh, shortly. Uh, let me just say, it's always good to be in the presence of um, other warriors for justice and economic security, to know that this is a small sampling of America that is um, clear that while these fascists might have a plan, we have a vision. And that is for our children, our grandchildren, and their children to be liberated and standing up and having a future, a future that is not based on division and hate and, cut and cutthroat measures. So with that, friends, I got to say to you that the 2023 elections had tremendous lessons for us in Oakland and for workers and marginalized people everywhere um, for the 2024 presidential election. Take Back Our Cities is really timely because it's combining protest and voting to win our basic human needs. Arlene Hip and I are excited to be sharing with you part of our, fa our fall Laney College Poor People's Campaign teach-in, Oakland United Against Hate. It was a strategy session aimed at alerting the public to the danger we face from the billionaire right-wingers and exposing how they steal our rights and freedom by attacking Black elected, black elected women fighting for basic human needs. Today, we are weaving together the fight to defend democracy using voting and protest as central strategies to defend basic human needs, such as housing, education, healthcare, including reproductive freedom. Oakland has a proud history of fighting for Black, Brown, and poor people, always with the idea of revolutionary transformation. This is also an opportunity to share the poor people's campaign, fight for a third reconstruction and a moral revival in America. You will hear from fighters active in the care for community, community ready core and moms for housing. The first presenters you will be hearing are, were also, are also trainers. They are Nicole Dean and Dominique Walker and they will be the narrators of this segment. Dominique Walker is the founder of um, Moms for one of the founders of Moms for Housing, along with our own Carol Fife, who is now a councilwoman. Thank you. This is a training about Oakland's role in the fight against the right. Because a lot of times, right, we don't think that there is a right wing in the Bay Area. Sometimes people think that, like, oh, we're progressive here, like we don't have those people here, and it's just not true. So that's what we're going to talk about. The Bay Area is a place of international political significance. There is more wealth and power concentrated in the Bay Area than any other region in the world. Some of the biggest corporations in the world are based here. Wells Fargo, Visa, PG&E, Clorox, Kaiser, Twitter. That's just San Francisco and Oakland. We've also got Chevron, which is the second largest oil company in the world. That's located in Contra Costa County. Plus, the Bay is home to Silicon Valley, which houses like Apple, Google, Facebook, all the things. California has more billionaires than any other state, 186 of them to be exact. And 116 of those billionaires live here in the Bay Area. The Port of Oakland is the primary ocean gateway for international cargo in Northern California. It's a major hub for international commerce. And UC Berkeley is widely regarded to be one of the top public universities in the world. 
and it is a place that educates a lot of the people who go on to become these billionaires and governors and judges and senators. So there's a lot going on. And all of this stuff that's going on, the cities, San Francisco, Oakland, the corporations, the billionaires, the port, the university, all that exists on stolen land as the result of a genocide against the Ohlone, the Ramatush, and other indigenous people. The political, economic, and social systems in the Bay Area are predatory white nationalist systems. So I want to make that clear. That's like the, the political assumption that we're starting from here. And the history of the Bay Area, while it is a history of racist and capitalist oppression, it is also a history of radical resistance. The Bay Area historically has been the birthplace and a hot spot of militant movements for racial and gender justice, anti-war, anti-imperialism, and anti-capitalism. Of course, most notably, Oakland is the birthplace of the Black Panther Party for self-defense. Because of the strength of these resistance movements, we have the most progressive, the leftist city, county, and state governments with the most robust social safety net. It's not enough, like I'm, it's not good enough, but the Bay Area basically per creates the progressive ceiling for policies nationwide. So for example, when the pandemic hit, the Oakland City Council passed the strongest eviction moratorium in the country. Oakland sets the standard for the strongest protections that tenants can get. And because we set that standard here, the National Association of Realtors spends big money to fight pro-tenant candidates in local elections. Like they spent $1 million on the Berkeley rent board election in 2020 to try to stop Dominique from getting elected, which they failed to do. They basically just threw a million dollars down the drain trying to stop her and her slate. Um, but they're doing that for a reason. They're a national landlord real estate lobby and like what happens in Berkeley and Oakland is very, very important to them. So the right wing understands the significance of the Bay Area and we can see that in how the right wing organizes here and how the Bay Area fits into their strategy as they contest for power nationally. The alt-right tried to take power in Berkeley in 2017. And in the last few years, there's been a major national right wing focus on San Francisco uh, with successful recalls of a progressive district attorney and the school board. And this is a screen cap from Ron DeSantis, um, who sucks and is running for president. He traveled to San Francisco to film his campaign ad. Um, that's for a reason. His campaign ad focused on homelessness in San Francisco. And that's important because basically hating on homeless people is playing a more and more central role in the authoritarian rights recruitment efforts. So it's similar to like how the alt-right used misogyny, like the hatred of women, they use that to attract lonely, alienated young men into the alt-right. So now they're strategically exploiting people's frustrations and fears about growing homelessness to create a pipeline into extreme right-wing ideology. I'm gonna explain how and why they do that. It's a convenient issue for the right because black people, queer and trans people, and disabled people, all groups that experience structural oppression in the status quo system, are disproportionately represented in the unsheltered population. And those are the groups of people that the right hates. So this is how the pipeline for the right wing has developed this dominant narrative about homelessness. On the left here, you see Chris Rufo, who is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research, which is a conservative think tank with a $15.7 million annual budget. The Manhattan Institute is a major right-wing institution. It's what brought us Reaganomics, the broken windows policing theory, and the Ferguson effect, the idea that crime spikes as a direct result of anti-police sentiment. The Manhattan Institute sponsors thought leaders like Chris Rufo to promote the narrative that, quote, homelessness is a human problem, not a housing problem that housing first and harm reduction are failed policies, and that, quote, the solution to homelessness is to enforce public order. That's their narrative. After building a career on this anti-homeless narrative, Chris Rufo has gone on to link discussions of LGBTQ issues in schools to grooming, 
he's like one of the main proponents of that whole um, thing. And he's become a major promoter of the anti-critical race theory hysteria all over the country. So then we go to Joe Lonsdale, who has amassed a $425 million personal fortune as a co-founder of Palantir, a surveillance tech company used by ICE and the Department of Defense. So he's made all this money and he's taken it upon himself to found the Cicero Institute, which is basically like an ALEC for anti-homeless policy. ALEC is a right-wing think tank that churns out model legislation um, and just gives them to right-wing senators in states so they can pass lots of legislation really quickly. The Cicero Institute pushes legislation that criminalizes people for sleeping outdoors, that discourages public funding for permanent supportive housing. So far, this, quote, reducing street homelessness legislation has been introduced in the state legislatures of Georgia, Texas, Arizona, Missouri, Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Tennessee. The organization that wrote that legislation is here in the Bay Area. Last year, Cicero funded a short documentary called Homelessness, the Reality and the Solution for Prager University, huge YouTube, YouTube platform that has been reaching over one third of US residents with its short video content since 2018. Prager University is funded by Christian nationalist GOP mega donors with ties to the fossil fuel industry. And the Southern Poverty Law Center describes Prager University as, quote, connecting conservative media consumers to the dark corners of the extreme right. So this documentary featured several San Francisco-based independent journalists. They're not independent. They're on the payroll of these Christian nationalists. And it promotes the narrative that the primary drivers of homelessness are drug addiction and mental illness and personal failing. So that's the pipeline. It goes from the Manhattan Institute to the pundits, to the policy organizations, to the online propaganda platforms, and then it goes to mainstream media like Fox News. And this national narrative is effectively pushing the San Francisco government to the right. The mayor, several supervisors, and even the governor are now appealing to the right-wing Supreme Court to empower the San Francisco city government to shut down encampments and criminalize homeless people. Like they're winning in San Francisco. And now I'll pass it to Dominique. Oakland is the hard target. Unlike Frisco, Oakland has been trending left instead of right since 2020. In 2020, Oakland housing justice organizer, Carol Fife was elected to city, Oakland City Council. Last year, moderately progressive Shang Tao beat right wing neoliberal Lauren Taylor in the mayor's race. And Pamela Price won a district attorney seat running on a platform of ending youth incarceration and holding police officers accountable for misconduct. Governance in Oakland has moved significantly to the left in the last three years. The right is investing in attacking and trying to break the progressive movement in Oakland. That's why we need to continue to escalate our organizing and to build on the wins we've gotten so far, rather than resting on our laurels. Okay, we so saw in San Francisco how these right-wing institutions like the Manhattan Institute and Prager University work to create this dominant narrative about homelessness to change the politics. We see how once the right establishes a dominant narrative, the moderate and liberal Democrats start to cater to that narrative, and they're really following the leadership of right-wing fascists. Anybody heard the phrase, like, if you scratch a liberal, you'll get a fascist, a fascist bleeds? That's kind of what we see. So what we're saying is, like, narratives are a form of power. Establishing the dominant narrative is a big part of every political fight. It's an important form of power that sets the stage and cuts the terrain that we have to struggle on. Narratives can connect and mobilize people or isolate and uh, divide people. It can uphold power relationships or it can challenge power relationships. And there's a right-wing effort underway right now to establish 
a dominant narrative in Oakland. And we call that narrative the defund doom loop. Totally. They say that uh, an organized lie always be an unorganized truth. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They'll just repeat it over, like he said, over, they'll say it. It can be a lie and they will just say it over yeah. and over over and over and over again like the idea that opd has been defunded That's not they get more money every single year but they've said it so much that people we knock on doors every single week and people will tell us well they defunded the police mm. people believe it that's what we're talking about here and i'll pass to dominique now um thanks nicole and let's look at a recent example Bishop Bob Jackson wrote an op-ed for the Daily Mail, and the Daily Mail is a British tabloid newspaper and website. And the headline read, quote, Black people in Oakland are living in a lawless nightmare of streets turned into shooting galleries. Thanks to the radical defund the police anarchists, we can't let them condemn us all to hell. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, that that's what? like, a quote from what he wrote and the defund doom loop is a fundamentally racist specifically anti-black narrative and the bottom line of the narrative is that without a highly funded police state that is empowered to violate the civil rights of black people without consequences the inherently criminal dangerous violent black population will turn this city into a lawless hell where no one is safe that's the whole point of this narrative is to demonize black people and scapegoat us for all of society's problems mm -hmm. while not providing any solutions to the systematic problems the systematic genocide that's implemented that's right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right so in order to establish this kind of narrative successfully they have to create confusion because Oakland is not a place where outright right wing politics are popular, right? Like their left wing politics are popular in Oakland. We have when we have um, street demonstrations, it's thousands of people. Um, and so these people have to hide their politics. They can't be honest about who they are and what they're doing. And we've seen this before, like the alt the alt right which was a rebranding of neo-Nazi political tendencies, like people who want a white ethnostate, literally. That's not a popular politic in the United States anymore. So the alt-right needed the alt-light. Organizers, influencers, and spokespeople who didn't openly identify as alt-right or white nationalist and were mainstream enough to attract people who weren't Nazis and organize those people into a fascist hard right-wing coalition that included a lot of Nazis. So they didn't hold Nazi rallies, they held free speech rallies. Remember, they didn't wear swastikas, they wore MAGA hats. They didn't talk about white genocide, they talked about the great replacement. It's the same thing. Their function was to bring fascist politics into the mainstream, and in doing so, they helped move the Overton window far to the right. Ideological Nazis also infiltrated and hijacked mainstream right-wing organizations like the Berkeley College Republicans to gain access to that broader audience. So it's the same tactic, different set of cast of characters uh, here in Oakland right now. Um, one of the architects of the defund doom loop narrative is Sam Singer, um, who you might be familiar with. Sam Singer is a crisis PR hack. He's very high priced, I've heard. He's very, very expensive. People call him the master of disaster because he's who you call when you are rich and you fucked up and you need someone to, to fix it. And his clients include, include Chevron, Airbnb, Wedgwood, Union Busters, recently the NAACP, which we'll talk about. But Don um, had some experiences with Sam Singer during the mom's house occupation. Can you share? Um, yes, and like Nicole said, Sam Singer is one of the architects of this narrative here in the Bay. Um, he's the guy that capitalists call when they want to look good, even though they're doing horrible shit. Um, he tried to destroy our reputation um, during the occupation. He said that we were drug addicts. He said we were thieves. He paid people in the community and on the internet just to spread this narrative that we were just going around stealing people's houses. Um, he said that Wedgwood was sympathetic 
to our case, but he painted us as thieves and terrorists and painted this billion dollar corporation as the victim. He also tried to turn the public against us, but it failed because we stuck to our messaging and we out organized him. Right on. Oh. Mm. So, sisters, <clears throat> I'm getting the time yank. <laughs> Can get through a little bit. Um, if when the, um, I think we started. What did, what did you just say? I, I heard yeah, about two thing. minutes we could spare, but two minutes. Those <laughs> minutos. <laughs> All right, I think we started, but um, we, yeah, I just want to um, get where we're going. So, yes, yes, yes. Um, is anyone here familiar with the organization? You may have seen their lawn signs that say, even the power of neighbors to create a safe, livable city. It sounds good, right? So, just like the alt right and the alt light coalition use the issue of free speech to create that confusion and divide liberals and leftists. Neighbors Together uses this kind of language, like solidarity and solution, safe, livable city, we have a food garden. It's a political cover as they work to attack progressives and advance a law and order agenda. Because this is a right-wing astroturf organization that promotes this defund doom loop narrative and is working to get the city to crack down on, crack down on homelessness. And this group recently held a rally in East Oakland. You may have heard about it. It was on September 9th. Neighbors Together hosted this rally and they brought right wingers to speak at this rally. Um, one of those people, I'll try to go real quickly. This is Mary Thoreau. She's a Republican Party donor and she's the chairman and CEO of the Independent Institute, which is one of these right wing think tanks. Um, they fund right wing things um, like this book, The Diversity Myth, which was used by the alt right to organize on college campuses. And this lady isn't just right wing. She's actually right wing royalty. Um, her father was a close associate of Ronald Reagan. Um, he was the founder of the National Center for Privatization. Um, and so that's the kind of people that Neighbors Together Oakland is bringing. They also bring people like this, um, Jared Clickstein, who is a Texas-based activist. Um, and he is Fox News' go-to skid row expert. And I wanna show you after benefiting from Jared Quickstein's expertise on what it's like to be homeless, this is what Fox News has to say about homelessness. They say homelessness is not about affordable housing. Wow. It's drug addicts who want to wander around and live in tents on the sidewalk. Wow. Anti -social you can't subsidize antisocial behavior, you have to stigmatize it. You can't celebrate people with purple hair with nose rings. What? What? What the hell? Who are dressed like trash and make them right. like heroes. <laughs> are. These are people who have failed at life and they're on their deathbed. And if we're not honest about it, we're never going to fix this problem. This one is called blaming. Wow. Um, so. <clears throat> Fox wow. News. Like. Yeah. If you have ever experienced homelessness, if you're experiencing homelessness right now, you have got to like speak up and get with an organization where like you tell your story because they are trying to tell your story. And there are people who've had the experience of being homelessness that are happy to take a check from these right wingers and, and use these talking points and push agendas that are gonna make housing even more affordable for everybody. Um, so that's really why we're here today. And I wanna give Dominique a quick, a chance to finish her part and then I'll tell you how you can get involved in what we're doing and we'll wrap it up. You are right. We started a bit late. So we apologize for that. We're working on it. Okay. Dominique, come on. Um, okay. I'm sorry. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Um, I just wanted to um, also talk about how the right wing is putting black faces on their messaging. Um, it's important for us to know like what's going on like the oakland branch of the naacp is calling for a massive increase in funding for harsher punishment for youth caught up in the underground economy and the naacp's national platform on ending mass incarceration and this is something that um folks like loren taylor and seneca scott they both ran against shane Tao for mayor i just want folks to know that 
-hmm. when folks look at us look like us they might not necessarily be for us right. and to be very conscious of that and i know we're out of time and i can go into <laughs> a lot of detail but um yeah just wanted to let folks know to be conscious of that as you're organizing everybody that looks like us doesn't have our community's best interests at hand wow that's yes. so true mm. what we've shown you hopefully is that the pro-fascist right they have a coordinated strategy they have pipelines for funneling money Hey, thank you for showing that. I think we're going to, uh, at this point, we're going to call up our next panelist. Mm -hmm. wanna... I'm going to introduce Tim Noonan. Tim is a leader of the 19th Ward Mutual Aid in Chicago, Illinois, originally founded by families to help each other during the pandemic. 19th Ward Mutual Aid has been instrumental in the response to the crisis of asylum seekers sh shipped to Chicago by Texas Governor Abbott. Mutual Aid, which also calls itself Neighbors Helping Neighbors, has also been on the front line addressing Chicago's homelessness issue that is affecting all kinds of people regardless of color or immigration status. Tim Noonan was a candidate for 19th Ward Alderman in 2023. Welcome Hi, thank you. You can hear me okay, All right? Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I'm really um, humbled by the, the group of people that we have here today. It's really, uh, it's really wonderful. Um, what we're doing here down the south side of Chicago um, is we're receiving buses from uh, both Florida and from Texas from uh, where they're taking people who are arriving in the United States and then putting them on buses and promising jobs and promising all different wonderful things that Chicago could offer. Not that I'm dishing on Chicago, but the weather isn't that great if you're going to plan on being homeless in Chicago. So um, these people have been treated with indignities step by step, country by country, and mile by mile, coming along to here to, to Chicago. Uh, the, between uh, when they're in their countries due to our our foreign policies that have made the, uh, Venezuela in the shape that it's in. It's Venezuela's, for, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Then we're getting mostly Venezuelans coming here to Chicago, uh, probably about 80 to 90% of them. Uh, we've gotten quite a few Angolans as well and Colombians as well. But we're seeing a large influx of people from Venezuela coming here to Chicago. And we know that how United States has in, uh, has their policies in regards to Venezuela is causing their economy to to collapse. And, and then they have their there is also political issues as well that they're that, that the economy is having a really uh, difficult time sustaining itself. So just like anything else, just like any other country, they're going to move to a place where they could find a brighter future for their families. Uh, no one's leaving um, the the country of origin by by choice. You know, I, my parents are both from Ireland. Uh, my dad liked to say, "If you could eat the uh, it, you, if you could eat the scenery, you'd be doing pretty good." But you can't. Um, but in so many of them are having this the 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 hard conversation of saying, you know, the that. We don't have a future here. You meaning you, you, these young people who are making these travels do not have a future here in this country, and you need to find it elsewhere. And they make an arduous journey, risking life and limb, and their financial and financial uh, savings to be able to make it to the United States. And they're being exploited by uh, by gangs in through the Darien Gap. They're being exploited in every single country they get to, only to come to the land of the free uh, and then be greeted by the uh, Texas um, in Texas with promises of, 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 of being able to come to Chicago and being able to kind of make a brighter future. So, so we get, we get people coming hungry and uh, arriving here in Chicago and well, as a, as a, um, a mutual aid group, we do call each other's neighbors, helping neighbors. And we, we, these are our newest neighbors. They've come to our community. We are obligated as humans to be able to 
greet them and try to restore dignity that has been stripped away from them. And where I believe we're, uh, we're, that is a revolutionary act to be able to try to restore dignity because restoring dignity is also giving them a voice. And by giving them a voice is allowing them to speak and to be able to be heard. And that is very revolutionary because we, there are powers that be are trying to say, shut up, be quiet, go away, be the, uh, go, uh, you know, have your tent under the expressway, have your, um, uh, set up your tarps across across uh, uh, the street in a park or something like that. So we're all, they're they're putting trying to be put in a box and then they put the box away. They're not trying to solve the 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 issues here. Um, when it very much in a Chicago fashion is they try to separate groups. You know, we're having a lot of the African American communities who are saying, "What about us? What? How? How can we? We've been asking for these resources, and the, we've been denied, 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 and now we have um, these migrants coming in, and now you say they're open. So they're building this tension between groups, and and it, it is just so and it allows the politicians to take a step aside and say, "Look at them fight with each other." you know, and, and, and keeping their hands clean, where really these communities are all looking for the same thing. They're looking for uh, that dignity that they've been denied, both here locally in Chicago and the ones who are newest neighbors. They've been denied their community. They've been denied food. They've been denied their voice. So what we're trying to do is trying to restore that. And it's a difficult thing to do, which, you know, we have to start with to make sure they're healthy. And we have to make sure they have food and that they're not sleeping on the floor in the police station. That's what we have right here. We have we have police stations and we have over 2000 people sleeping on floors of police stations. And as you might know, in Chicago, it gets pretty cold up here. We had um, up to 179 people at our particular police station and we had 25 tents in a garden across the way. So it was a matter of once it started getting cold then people start were motivated to move. There just seems to be no plan and no vision for what we're trying to do in regards to homelessness. And it's not like we don't have the buildings that exist here in Chicago. We do. We do have buildings. And if you challenge saying, why don't we do this? Why don't we use a CTA? Because we're uh, looking for warming centers. Why don't we use a CTA as the Chicago Transit Authority, which is the L system here? Um, can we set people up there? No, we can't. No reason why we just can't. Well, what are these people supposed to do? Are we starting to get a body count? You know, th then we're going to have start having statistics like that. Um, I have um, joined in the past. Um, there, the Cook County has a service of in, uh, of um, homeless uh, and unidentified uh, bodies that they bury uh, two or three times a year, and there is a um website through the county that actually you could see the faces of the people who died just to try to reclaim to get put names to these people and if you take a moment to see the faces of people who have who have suffered through this it's really you can only do it for a little while because it's really heart-wrenching and it, and these are the people who we're trying to 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 put in a drawer in a way you know if we're if we're trying to get people to be to work with us and to be able to find their talents is we have to listen to them. We have to give them that dignity. We have to give them a home and home is where they set up roots and be able to be able to move on and then be able to register their the kids in school and then be able to flourish as a community. So years of Chicago has lost a lot of um, people out of the city due to a mayor who closed nearly 50, 50 uh, schools here in Chicago. And we could definitely use people to be able to uh, to repopulate areas. So it's not like it's not like many other cities where oh we just have too many people. No, we could use them when we and we have the room. It's just political politically inconvenient. And then with adding in these tensions, neighbors our community members are saying no, not in our backyard because you know what you didn't help us before. How do you know we're uh, how, how, why are you not you know apparently aren't going to help us now? And where the city likes to do is they like to put these camps these these uh in well they they're doing these things called a tent 
a base camp, they call them. And they're with the IRAs internment camps that you would remember that in from World War II. And they're putting them in underserved neighborhoods. And they, and they, uh, these are just adding more pressure to a neighborhood who's already been devastated from years and years of disinvestment. So it's it's not right. It's 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 not we're not taking responsibility and uh, uh, for not only what we call ourselves a sanctuary and welcoming city is we're not being a sanctuary and we're not being welcoming and we're not being true to our, being human and um, helping each other to be, to be able to get, uh, bring the, these voices here. And frankly, from a Chicago and we could use the people. So, um, with, and, and these are young families who are, um, there's a program that just started the, uh, that was announced just today that, they're going to remove all the people out of the police stations because they're current in the police stations. And most of the police stations are, a majority of the police stations are headquartered in disinvested areas. So they're already pressure put on there. So then now they're going to move them to shelters. But now there's a time limit they're going to have. is a 60-day time limit on shelters. And so after the shelters, they're given a voucher, a 90-day voucher. After 90 days, we're done, you know? And there are many people we have we have had, and mind you, many of these people want to work. So it's not that there's an issue, but the mental health issues, the physical health issues, the the even not only in the journey here, but when they got here, there has been uh, reports of um, of physical abuse and mental abuse when they got here. So by restoring dignity, and uh, and that includes a home and being able to be listened to and a job and to be able to vote are, are going are, are really what we're looking to do to bring people together so um if there's uh anything we could do we try to stand by our our message of neighbors helping neighbors because that's what we're trying to do um to accomplish um you know to accomplish our community because if if we have somebody we need to have an un inclusive community. Otherwise, it's not a community at all. There's no community of have and have nots. It's got to be all or nothing. And that's what we're trying to accomplish. And what we may use, we may change the term of what a neighbor might be. It might be across the city. But what we do is we want to share, our, we share our resources with other neighbors just to make sure that we are able to all work together as a, as a community because through these times we all need to work together to be able to move forward and and, and factions and fighting just only help uh, big you know only help the people in power and politicians so um yeah so that's uh anything that um um we were hoping to get um more out of the political situation with with our mayor and everything but it's it's been really kind of difficult to see and i'm sure he's having a difficult time navigating a very entrenched machine but it's been really kind of um hard to see where this um they're taking a page from new york's uh uh mayor about how their policy about keeping um migrants and asylum seekers here uh in the the shortened uh front time frame so it's it's not um is not it's not restoring dignity it's not really giving them the voice so um yes so uh oh sorry i'm just kind of reading um in funding sources somebody had just asked what we been doing has been just the community we've been asking um we have a we just ask people you know oftentimes people would come to us and say, what do you need? So we have a church that is full, a basement that's completely full with clothes. We have full-time people just going through clothes. And we do some, we, when we have, um, we sometimes employ migrants and we pay them to help sort through clothes. What we have done, um, we have a website called uh, 1919aid.com um, where we are able to, uh, to be able to, to kind of give, out uh, events and what's going on today, we're actually having a um, a community Thanksgiving, which we're trying we're we're inviting all our new neighbors who are not familiar with the uh, the holiday of Thanksgiving to join our community, and then we we sh we break bread and in, in in the true sense of Thanksgiving to be able to um, get to know each other because this is our community and we welcome people that that are joining community and that how we could uh 
present um, as we can uh, we join people to make a better community because what we're doing is it's like a drop of water and a, a, a drop of water and, and and as it ripples out it, it becomes larger and larger waves now the drop of water is either the how the people are treated if you're treating them very poorly you're going to have a, an echoing effect of 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 circular uh um of be it um poverty be it homelessness and abuse so it will go out to generation 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 what we're trying to do is we have an opportunity right now we're trying to make a positive impact and we want to have that ripple out in the same manner in a positive manner and then we're going to have um members who are going to be in our community our our dentists our doctors our uh teachers will have these will be the people that we're we're going to try to uh to foster here and even maybe one day maybe they'll be also part of the uh the police and then we'll provide that dignity that they're sorely not getting now so uh thank you and if you have any questions Thank you, Tim. Uh, we're going to go into Q&A for both the, the Oakland uh, panelists and for you at this point. So thank okay. you very much. Um, we, uh, during the Q&A, we want to encourage people to uh, uh, raise your hand and talk. Uh, we do have several questions lined up from the chat, and I will be uh, 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 reading some of them. Uh, and this one was for Arlene. Uh, uh, we'll ask Arlene to speak first since she hasn't had a chance to speak yet. Um, and, and this has to do with, uh, well, actually, I mean, we have a situation in both Oakland and Chicago where we have a progressive mayor. And I think the uh, pen, the, the tape earlier, they described your mayor in, in San Jose as being moderate, excuse me, in Oakland as being moderately progressive as opposed to your council member who is very progressive. But uh, what what difference does it make having a mayor like that in power? And I guess after you answer from Oakland, you can answer to Tim because that's what that's the the what this this dialogue is all about is how are we fighting this situation? How can we use the electoral arena to make these changes? to have people treated like human beings instead of just left on the floor of the police station. Uh, so uh, go ahead, Arlene. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. And I'm listening to these questions and it's a mirror of what's going on anyway, USA. And so we have people like Carol Fife, who is really moving the needle or many of the things that need to be done for the house here. One of the things that was done was measures that were passed. Measure Q was passed so that the vote is passed measure Q to fund the needs of the unhoused those who are living outdoors and working to design a plan that will impact in a very positive way, the very things that's needed. It needs more coordination and Measure Q is one of the measures that was passed to help with that. Um, another measure that was passed was Measure V. Now in California, we have uh, just cause. And just cause, is, it just means that it, every eviction has to have a legal reason. That is a protection because many people are sliding into homelessness because of the extreme rise of rents. And the next one was measure U which also is directly focused on building housing for extremely low income over the next 40, uh, 46 years. 
and 2,200 to 2,400 units in the next four, uh, 46 years, and 10,000 of them by 2030. So these are measures that was passed that are going to be helping people to move from where they are into where they need to be so that people have safe, healthy housing. There's resources for them to go to to get their needs met. Because when you're outdoors, you don't have water, <laughs> you don't have a home, you don't have a roof, you don't have heat, you don't have health, you don't have a multitude of things. So these are some of the things that were done through politics. Me these measures were passed because the voters of Oakland decided that this was a way for change to begin to happen. Thank you. Uh, Tim, do you have anything to add? I mean, what you, you touched on it briefly, but we had these huge revolutionary campaigns to elect these mayors and and how are how can we how can we take advantage of that to to make our lives better well actually yeah we did it we have some wins and we have some um uh challenges let's put it that way um there is a a program called bring chicago home uh it was for homelessness uh here in chicago there is um 65,000 um, homeless and 20,000 of them are children. Uh, the, on November 8th, there was a an agreement that it's going to put it be put to a referendum. So that 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 is that's what you thought that is a win, you know, is is that it's now going to go to the people and um, how it, it, it how it's uh, paid for or funded by is through a real estate tax. And the real estate tax is uh, for homes that are over a I think a million dollars or something like that. Um, and they're. So that is where the money will be funded for these wraparound services. So there is a win. Um, myself, I, I think that um, when Mayor Johnson, uh, Brandon Johnson is the Chicago's mayor, uh, when he was running against Paul Vallis uh, back and when they knew they were going head to head on March 1st, the biggest issue was going to be the refugee crisis here in Chicago. We sh they should have started planning then, and then went re so rather than wait until you're inaugurated, well, there should have been a plan that when they were inaugurated, when he was inaugurated, that it should have started going seamlessly forward then. But it seemed um, that wasn't the case. So there was a lot of catch up going on. Um, this recent development in regards uh, to uh, these time frames is disappointing. Um, there has been some caveats that have been put together. Uh, so we don't know if these caveats are going to be, um, if they're going to be a regular thing that are they are actually going to get um, removed from shelters and what are the circumstances where they, somebody could not actually leave the shelter? Because we have a lot of medical issues that we're dealing with a lot of uh, of our um, asylum seekers. So, uh, from the standpoint of homelessness, um, there's some you know some wins and some losses, uh, but yet I think we could do a lot more. And maybe that is maybe the revolutionary in me. And I guess where we, why can't we do more? We is there, there's there's enough here to be done. And the politics of trying to find out where the right place to put a base camp or wherever or, or where to uh, house people. And that seems to it's they take the, the political um, uh, realities seem to be more important than the actual realities on the streets, which is disappointing. But, yeah, I still I'm not I, I'm not I haven't given up on uh, uh, Mayor Johnson. It's just I'm hoping um, to see. Uh, more and I understand that he's very deliberate in his choices. So um, I'm hoping that uh, things will kind of um, gel more together as time goes on. And I just um, one of the things I think take back our cities was a part of what came out of you all's campaign there in Chicago, and it's something that uh, some of us here in Oakland have said we need to take back our cities campaign in every city across America, because the kinds of priorities that we're talking about in this room wouldn't have, uh, you know, it rejects the idea that there's scarcity. Um, we have billions that our country is sending toward to pay for wars 
and those uh, resources can and could be directed towards um, the people who are suffering here. And we'll talk later. I wanna make sure we get some of the other questions that were on the stack. But um, I think that trying to make sure we see what do we think can be replicated in this about both protests and um, voting and uh, encouraging um, folks to be involved from that standpoint. Thank you. Should we go to um, Desiree? Thank you for uh, waiting patiently. And we'll just ask you to unmute. Hi, thank you everyone. Thank you um, for this opportunity to um, have a little bit of your time here. Um, hello, especially out to Ethel and the comrades there. Um, uh, I jumped on late, but I got enough of, uh, I was listening and um, this is like the, one of the greatest things I would love to speak on is that um, I really feel that we need to start focusing on the federal dollars, federal government, and through Title VI. Um, I'm going to pick on West Sacramento because that's the latest information I've gotten on this topic. When I asked the um, city of, of West Sacramento what they were doing about the unhoused and how much of the goal, the percentage of money of the um, development plan we're building new apartments and complexes. How much of that was federal money? Because they take out federal loans to build these large um, uh, complexes on the basis that there's a goal attached and that they're going to meet that goal by giving that percentage of that housing to low income or immigrants. And they told me specifically that when uh, the previous mayor who was there, who I believe it was Cabaldon, through his, uh, when he was the mayor of that city, I believe, it's my opinion, okay? You have to research this. He allowed a buyback on that goal, which is happening all over the state and the nation. That means that when a developer builds 2,000 apartments, and let's say 200 of those apartments go to disadvantaged families, the city is allowing the developer and the middleman to buy back that goal and to when they buy it back, that means that they are renting those 200 apartments out for often the same amount of rent or a little bit higher. So they're excluding those who are disadvantaged. That is discrimination. And we need to start, I believe, looking into Title VI and the federal law to say, if you're using one penny of federal dollars, and you're using this to build these apartments, you are not allowed this buyback. Anyone who is doing this is equivalent to taking GEO and Civic Corps money, um, like, Cecilia, like Bill Dodd, our Senator in Yolo County, who took GEO and Civic Corps money and refused to give it back. That's his way of saying, I'm okay with brown people, indigenous peoples, children in dog kennels and chick cages. Mm -hmm. And this is the same thing. This is the same message they're giving to people and families who are at a disadvantage. We don't care about you. We don't care if you're unhoused. We're going to rent these apartments out and make a profit for it. And that's where I believe the fight is at, is to hold all of these cities and counties accountable and to say, excuse me, exactly who's getting federal dollars. If you're getting federal dollars, we want a goal. We want to know if there was a goal attached because Title VI requires that of the Civil Rights Act. If there was no goal, then you better you better reverse what you're doing or we're going to fight and shut your building down. To me, that is a wave of, 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 of uh, the fight back. Um, <clears throat> if we rely totally 100% on what the state is going to do or county or city money, then there's partners involved. And those partners are involved are most likely developers and they don't want to share a piece of that pie without a major fight. Or if they give us something back, it's going to be a little bone. And then the next five development projects, they're going to say, 
fuck you. We gave you what you want on that first project, but the rest of them were not. And that's where I believe we need to consider looking into. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, everyone. Desiree. Yeah, yeah, Desiree. You, yeah, 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 Desiree. Yeah, Desiree. Yeah, that's why in Alameda County and Contra Costa County, market rate is built one unit of extremely low income to five units of market rate is being right. built and there is no oversight no accountability going on and it's they're just going along like desiree said okay i'm going to stop uh i had a question that was in the chat can can you arlene or desiree or one of you describe what is the section six what that refers to title six excuse me Okay, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act explicitly uh, it, it, uh, it, it states that there cannot be any disadvantage, any racism, discrimination. And this is involves economic disadvantage as well. When I was a civil rights specialist, I had to go into communities and I had to, I had to have forums with the communities to inform them what project was coming in in the future, um, I had to identify what cultural people uh, who were impacted, what their language was, what their economic uh, situation was, uh, who, uh, um, what needs they needed. And if I could not come up with a solution with them based on what the community wanted, then I was, we were in violation of, a, of civil uh, title six of the Civil Rights Act. Title VI. And this is not being implemented like it used to be in the 80s. In the 90s, they started questioning whether Title VI was uh, appropriate. And some hmm. argued, I believe back east, that it was discriminative. But in court, uh, they want the, the, we, the government won, and, and um, Title VI does exist. However, Somewhere in the '90s, it was it was um, it was washed out. It it wasn't uh, focused on as much, and I believe because what happened is that a lot of NGO money was filtered into our communities. And remember, NGO money is really bones saying, here's some money, go do something good with it, but don't cross the lines yes, right. and you do what we say. <laughs> and if you don't, then we're gonna pull your money, but we're gonna yep. give you everything you want. So now we're calm, the waters are calm. But if you pull all that NGO money, you're gonna find how angry people get in the community real quick. So <laughs> the question is, is in order to remove that Band-Aid, we have to start looking at, in my opinion, when it comes to unhealth, um, the Title VI. Uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Okay. I so you agree with you. you. Wow. You know, you look at the housing elements and RENA, regional housing needs assessment, all of these things that the government is uh, saying that we need to do, but it is not attached to anything that's going to actually make changes to people who actually need it. And that's why we have to obviously come together. I know we've got a few hands in the, uh, we got a few great questions or comments. I know you guys are trying, probably also trying to pull them in. Cause what we are, we've been addressing is uh, the underlying issue here that Tim raised this, the real estate industry yeah. set up for making profit, not providing housing. And let's, but I, I want to make sure to get some of the other comments in. Let's go to Jesu. I know you Jesu. Thank you. No, and you know, um, I, I uh, you, you were talking about, we went in, I went in so hopeful with Mayor Johnson and fought like a motherfucker on his campaign. And we also have the right alders in these committees, which during Lori Lightfoot, they didn't have any hearing, or if they had hearings, nothing happened, right? So right. we have the right kind of socialist and progressive alders. I think one thing that Oakland has done well is have that progressive tax that's supporting your efforts. And, and we don't have that. Um, supposedly, right. I don't even know how many millions of dollars we're in debt now, allegedly. But Tim, this is a question for you, brother, because I know you know the information. Tell them how much money they're paying these contractors, at least one of them, to build these 10 cities. Because my thing, this is some patent BS, because if they can spend millions of dollars to put them in military tents, you can do something better, right? right? Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're the last... There's 
millions of dollars. It was twenty nine million dollars went into the uh, last round uh, for for. There's two groups called one called Favorites and another one called OEMC. Um, their 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 background is um, prison uh, guards and that. So. Oh my God! They're bringing um, people in <laughs> from Texas and that to help arrange um, uh, shelter, doing shelter security, and uh, being able to do, um, you know, for the movement of people from bus by buses and that. So, and they are going and um, are just taking they've they they're just taking people and moving them into the shelters, and these are just cattle to them. Well, they're, right. not, they're not actually right. people. So no. um, so there's millions and millions of dollars being spent on another degree of 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 of, uh, of exploitation, another yes. degree of of yes. indignities. And uh, these are families and that that are coming here and we try to to bring them, you know, to help them with their dignity when they get here. But it's just right around. It's just, again, it's just a numbers game. We're moving this person, this person. We don't care. There, as a matter of fact, we had an issue with it regards to a, uh, um, a mother had lost a baby and we're looking to get a shelter and they, they refused to have the, uh, the couple to be, to, to be together in a shelter because since they didn't have a child, and they lost a the baby, so they had to be separated. And so there's a lot of mental health issues, and a lot oh of, and she has not been able to be taken care of uh, uh, fi uh, physically as well. We're we're providing. I know I'm going off topic, but I we're, we're providing uh, medical care, and our medical care that we're not the C Cook County is not providing medical care. We're 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 providing it through volunteers, and our organization is picking up prescriptions and uh, over-the-counter drugs mm -hmm. and whatever they need. To right? we, we get broken people, we try to put them back together again. Right. In many levels. So, but back to the point of there's so much money being thrown around, and it's it, it, it's we're getting federal money to have from Texas to be brought to for people to be brought to Chicago. And then we're going back to Texas to get those same contractors to take care of them here in Chicago. We're not even hiring Chicago contractors. We're hiring the ones the same people who brought them here. So right. it's, it's incredibly frustrating and it's a, uh, it's uh, a complete waste of money. And we have so many volunteers that are not getting paid a dime and are going, putting money out of their pockets while, while we have a lot, while we have interlopers coming in and and uh, and basically uh, inst trying to institutionalize uh, our people and and and, and strip their uh, humanity. I know we want to go Thank to Carmen, you. but I think there's a connection between what we're saying here that you all are volunteering to do what government is abdicating responsibility on, and a part of what we when we're talking about taking back our cities is we want to put those things together, right? that government has an obligation. This is our public dollars. And oftentimes we kind of think that our job at in elections, it, it ends at the voting booth. But really we're saying it has to start well before that, all of these efforts of the groups here. And I wanted to make sure another announcement, uh, Hip Hop Congress is hosting us on Clubhouse. So this is being, at the same time that we're in this room, we're also blasting out to the internet universe and Raman Jamal and Lisa Arnis and DeFranco, um, uh, there you'll see them listed. Those uh, brothers and sisters have ensured that that happens as a part of this partnership. And we really wanna thank them for doing that. Thank you, Ethel. We're running a little late, but we wanna get to Carmen's question and Mark's, and then we'll take a short break. And the, the good news is that when we talk about Pittsburgh and Sacramento, we're wrestling with the same problems. Yes. So yeah. uh, we can continue this discussion. And I also, I know some of you are on tight schedules, but anyone of the panelists who can stick around and be part of the Q&A after we get into the second part as well, that would be helpful. Uh, Carmen, go ahead. Carmen from yeah. San Jose, California. Yes, oh, wow. okay. Uh, so Carmen Brammer and very excited about this conversation. In fact, now I'm actually even more motivated, kind of lost a little bit. So you guys have remotivated. Right. I appreciate that. Um, nice. And one of the things that we've been looking at here in Santa Clara County and San Jose in particular is the democracy dollar. So as everyone has talked about, money is what what do we have in the Bay Area? 116 billionaires. Yes. So they're making the decisions for us. 
But I know that Oakland has um, a program or a pilot that they're looking to start in 2024 around democracy dollars where, so I wonder if anybody on the call here knows about that. No, that's usually what I would call Carol Fife and say, Carol, come talk to us about that. So we can... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Learning. we were ready for a lot of things, but maybe, maybe Arlene does. Maybe Arlene. Yeah. So we're looking to do that here too in uh, San, in San Jose, particularly right now, because San Jose is the largest city in Santa Clara right. County. Yes, and it's where you know, as taxpayers, we contribute to funds because so many people who want to run because they're going up against these large packs yes. and super pack money. Yes, don't have the funding. So how do we set them up? You know, our progressive candidates. How do we set them up for success by ensuring there's funding available? Because that's one of the one of the hurdles, not the only, but one of the hurdles that they have and start taking away the influence of these um, big dollar donors out of our politics and really removing that funding. And I know California has tried a few times to pass a, you know, something where we're not doing that, where, you know, where we don't have big donors, but it has yet to really pass, even though we have a Democratic governor, or Democratic legislator, it still has yet to be passed. So I would love to hear if anyone from Oakland knows about what the program is that you guys are doing and give some insight into it. That would be wonderful. I, I just know a little bit, and I think it's like in 20, the 2026 election cycle that they're looking for this democracy uh, dollars program uh, to be implemented to assist those who are for our agenda to be able to participate and run for office. And so I, I don't know a lot about it, but of that part I do know. So maybe is there someone I can connect with after the call? Because we would yeah. it'd be great to get um, information so that we don't have to, this way, at least we don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you guys have already yes. done it, learn from you and uh, develop some best practices. Uh, those you, Marvin, campaign. We'll, we'll hook you up with uh, uh, our Oakland panelists. Uh, awesome. After the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. I know we're running over time, but do uh, if Ron we should is have here, a, we should get Mark's yeah. question and then we'll go to a short break. Go ahead, Mark. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am speaking to you on unceded Miwok Coastal Territory, um, a former resident of Oakland, a graduate of Berkeley High. <laughs> what I'd like to offer the conversation is a bit unorthodox. So please open up just a little bit to receive something that may feel revolutionary when it lands in your system. So many of the billionaire class are co-opting our spaces. One of the ways that we can make change is to co-opt their hearts and bring them into our spaces and create economic things that work, that help homelessness. It's very unusual because we are so much in resistance and revolution, and it's important that we keep going on that work. But we also have to beat them at their own game, which is a psychological warfare. We have to educate these people and win them into the kind of work that we're all doing. And we shouldn't forget that that's a possibility. Spiritual development, the process of awakening people to their privilege and the benefits that they receive could also be applied to create new economic possibilities mm -hmm. that exist within the capitalist space, co-opting capitalism to serve the underserved people. That's my offering. And I recognize that it is a bit unorthodox and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak into this space. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, any panelists want to address that? Well, you said we need to go to a break. I think it's a great topic. It's something I want to invite the brother to go over to the National Poor People's Campaign uh, and look at our principles um, because it, it we don't frame it that way, but we do frame it in a moral language and um, the principles of um, um, of uh, one, making sure that we address the, the multiple components of racism, militarism, and um, um, various forms of oppression and exploitation. Um, but this idea of just rejecting this notion that there just isn't enough resources, forget that. Uh, those resources can be and should be applied. And so I would invite just brief, that's what I'd say, let's start that discussion. Um, and it's, you know, in our capacity 
of a, as a chapter of the Poor People's Campaign, that is something that is front and center in our mind. And Reverend Barber actually has written another whole book uh, that speaks to some of that. Thank you, Ethel. I guess we'll go to break now. Uh, we're, it's just that uh, we've got a little musical interlude for about four minutes. I just wanted to tell Carmen, I put the link in um, in the chat for the uh, Democracy Dollars, if she would like to go there. Thank you. Thank you. Cease fire now. 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 No more genocide. 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 Oh. 
Beautiful picture there and beautiful calming song. Thank you for that. So we're going to jump into um, our next panel. And I'm going to introduce Jasiri X. Jasiri is the co-founder and CEO of One Hood Media Academy in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a collective of socially conscious artists and activists who utilize diverse skills and resources to increase awareness about and eliminate injustice affecting people around the world. It organizes artistic, educational, cultural, and performance-based forums, provides workshops and curriculum consultation, and provides um, consultation to artists seeking to establish fruitful, independent careers and organizations that seek to establish a culture of equity, art, and activism. One Hood is made up of creatives who work in, for, and with Black communities to challenge injustice, raise awareness, and unify humanity. Thank you so much, Jasiri. Um, uh, peace. Uh, thank you for, for having me. Um, yeah, just a little bit about, I mean, you know, One Hood came together um, around 2006, and it was really a group of us that, um, you know, it's not that we had an issue with, you know, some of the established organizations in Pittsburgh. Um, we just, they, they were older, and we felt like, you know, we wanted to, organized with uh, hip hop. We were members of the hip hop community and hip hop culture. Um, and so we wanted to organize with hip hop culture. And we thought by doing so, we could have a greater uh, response from the young people in our community. Uh, so we came together and started One Hood. The idea was really, initially it was around like community violence. You know, I don't use the term black on black crime. That's a white supremacist term. Well, people can make crime where they live. Um, and so, but um, a lot of times at the time, Pennsylvania, we led the nation in community violence. Um, in our community, a lot of people think Philly, uh, we actually had a higher per capita murder rate than Philadelphia. So we began to use hip hop as a way to bring communities and neighborhoods together that, not, that traditionally did not um, weren't together. Um, our concept around One Hood is, you know, we all suffer the same uh, community ills, um, you know, wh whatever hood you're from, we're all dealing with you know, higher unemployment rates, community violence, police violence, lack of affordable housing, failing schools. But if we came together um, in unity, we could deal with the systemic issues uh, that really affect our community. So we kind of um, evolved. Uh, we started the One Hood Media Academy actually in 2010 as a response to a study uh, that was done in Pittsburgh about how the media portrays Black men specifically, um, where, you know, 90% of the time uh, portrays Black men as you know, criminals or athletes. Uh, when it came to quality of life stories, it was less than two three percent. Um, at the time, you know, I emerged as a hip hop artist, a socially conscious hip hop artist, uh, basically creating an alternative narrative. I did a song in 2010 called What if the Tea Party Was Black uh, that went viral. And I was able to uh, become a full time hip hop artist, but at the same time, I would come back to Pittsburgh. A lot of people don't know about, and I'm talking about Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, no disrespect to the Bay, you know, we the Pittsburgh with the H. You know what I'm saying? Um, Pittsburgh traditionally has the poorest uh, inner city black community in the country. Um, Pittsburgh also in 2019 was called the worst place in America for a black woman to live. Uh, that basically a black woman could live anywhere else in the country and have a better quality of life. So a lot of people don't know that Pittsburgh kind of deals with this. And with that obviously comes community violence. But when we started the uh, One Hood Media Academy, we attracted a lot of young, young, young hip hop artists but for us, it was really about empowering uh, specific, particularly black youth and brown youth to tell our own stories. Um, and we began to use social media, right? This is the emergence of social media. You know, I, my career, I was an independent artist. I use social media to create alternative narratives. And we began empowering our young people to do the same. We kind of evolved into like an arts collective. Um, and so in 2016, uh, we launched the um, One Hood Artivist Academy, an academy specifically uh, to teach artists and to, to to support artists and platform artists that use their gifts and talents to speak to issues of social justice. Uh, that was a direct response to the presidency of uh, Donald Trump. I uh, tell people that, you know, one of the ironic things that happened is when Donald Trump became president, I became more relevant as an artist uh, because I was an artist that spoke about white supremacy um, a lot. So it was like, it was like people finally was like, oh, you know, what this dude had been saying was was correct. Um, and so 
we were able to launch the Artivist Academy with support from the Heinz Endowment and the Nathan Cummings Foundation. I got a fellowship uh, from the Nathan Cummings Foundation uh, to start that, um, to support artists that use their gifts and talents to speak to issues of social justice. Uh, flash forward to, so I I actually, because I got this fellowship from Nathan Cummings, came back to Run, run, run One Hood uh, Media in 2018. In 2018, really kind of like all hell broke loose in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, in 2018, we had a high-profile police killing of a young man named Antoine Rose II. Uh, he was unarmed. He was running away from a police officer. He was shot three times in his back. Um, he was killed, unfortunately. Um, and um, we began to organize. It was on videotape. Uh, so we began to organize. I'm an artist that had been, and I was the first artist to do a song around Oscar Grant, first artist to do a song around Trayvon. So as an artist, I had been, you know, um, I'd been in, the Bay. I've been in, um, you know, New York City after Eric Gardner's death. I've been in Baltimore, you know, after the uprising there. I've been in Ferguson. And that's like now it's happened in my own city. So we began to organize um, our community to get justice for Antoine Rose. Uh, a few months later in October, uh, we had the Tree of Life massacre with the largest massacre of Jewish people in the history of the United States. Um, you know, nine, um, a, a guy ran up into a synagogue and specifically chose this synagogue is because uh, these were Jewish people that were helping uh, migrants and helping immigrants in Pittsburgh. So he specifically chose that because they had chose to use their synagogue as a place to help people um, that were coming to Pittsburgh and needed resources. Um, and so we began to do a lot of really Black Jewish solidarity work in the wake of that, particularly around, you know, white supremacist violence that was attacking both of our communities, specifically with organizations like Ben the Ark and Repair the World. Um, and so... Um, that's when we started also to get involved in electoral politics. Um, we began working with a national organization called Movement Voter Project. Uh, basically, they had got support for a DA's race. Uh, we have a traditionally racist DA. Um, so they said, hey, you know, he kind of reached out to say, hey, we need one hood um, to, to be a part of this. And I, initially, I kind of was like, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a politician. I don't know how to do this. Uh, but one of our founding members had just left his job. He'd been in politics his whole career. He was our political person named Kahari Mosley. So Kahari Mosley helped uh, us to build uh, um, not, you know, our kind of civic engagement model at One Hood. We also have a C4 called One Hood Power. So in 2019, we got involved in this DA's race. We won the city, but it was a countywide race. Unfortunately, we lost that race. Uh, but in 2020, we were able to organize, uh, you know, Pennsylvania went, went with Donald Trump in 2016. We were able to help Pennsylvania go go blue um in 2020. Um and so if you, you know, you're welcome, Pennsylvania decide the election if you, you know, voted for John. <laughs> and we did a lot of cultural organizing. We did because of COVID, we organized these outdoor festivals in historically black neighborhoods um in Pittsburgh, where because we had early voting where you could come get your food, have some entertainment, and then go vote. Um, that's one of the things we did in 2021. Uh, we elected the first black mayor in the history of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, Ed Ganey, um, a progressive as well. Um, our, our, our former mayor, to just to put in perspective, our former mayor was the first mayor, uh, incumbent mayor to lose a primary in Pittsburgh since 1910. Uh, but, you know, he was somebody that, you know, as a white progressive, just kept calling the police on us while we were protesting. And so, uh, you know, we organized to get him out of there. We also in 2021 elected um, five progressive judges, um, all women, three black women um, in Pittsburgh. Um, and then in 2022, we elected the first black congresswoman in the history of Pennsylvania, not from Philly side, no disrespect to Philly, but from in Western Pennsylvania, Summer Lee. Um, and if you are not familiar with Summer Lee, just an amazing, uh, uh, strong pop, pop voice, you know, uh, speaking truth to power. Um, and so in this current election, we were able to, unfortunately, we had the DA race again. Unfortunately, you know, we didn't win our DA race. We thought we was going to, it was close. Uh, but, you know, you know, the DA, you know, the he ran, he, he lost the primary and then ran as a, as a Republican, got a, a lot of outside money and, you know, just tried to scare people, really. And unfortunately, the progressive DA that was running against him kind of bought into that fear and you know he really didn't stand into his values all the way up until the, the end of the election 
uh, but we were able to elect uh, um, the first woman as county executive uh, and Sarah Inamorado, a progressive as well. And our civic engagement director, Kari Mosley, is now my city councilman, um, you know, ran for city council. The city councilman decided not to run against him. I mean, because he knew what it was. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I think, you know, the last thing I'll just share is, I mean, we organize culturally. Um, and, and to be honest, we've, we've moved away from protesting and more into what we call cultural organizing. Um, because for us, um, you know, we we organize with culture. We organize with hip hop. Um, you know, we celebrated hip hop's 50th birthday this year. We had a sold out um, concert with the locks. We also did a free kind of honoring of Pittsburgh hip hop's uh, uh, legends um, in an area in Pittsburgh called Market Square. But we just found like we've had more success organizing around joy, organizing around music, organizing around culture, organizing around food, uh, then organizing like against something. Uh, we've we've had more success organizing for something, for a new world, for a new reality, for a new way. Um, and so, you know, we're One Hood Media on all social media, the number one uh, hood media, if you want to follow us. The last thing I'll say is um, we also use media a lot. Uh, we started a website called BlackPittsburgh.com. Um, basically, during COVID, uh, we started a series of um, kind of community town hall meetings uh, one was called What Black Pittsburgh Needs to Know About COVID-19. One was called Ask a Black Doctor About COVID-19. And we just began to talk about just issues that affected our community. We also started a podcast called This Week in White Supremacy uh, that was uh, picked up by Free Speech TV. We're on Free Speech TV uh, every week. I think it's Friday now um, at, at 9 p.m. So um, I just feel like, you know, culture, media, um, a lot of it, particularly right now, social media is about messaging. Um, so we put a lot into um, making sure like our messages are strong, uh, our visuals are strong, our graphics are strong, and our culture is strong. You know what I'm saying? And so that being said, I'm just here to react y'all. One hood. Shout out to my brother, Ramon, too. Uh, Jamal from Hip Hop Congress, man. Shout out to them and the work that they do. Thank you, Tassiri. Um We're running a little late, so we're going to go with uh, Eric. Eric um, is a former Region 3 director of the California Democratic Party, former delegate to the Sa Sacramento Central Labor Council, current member of the Democratic Party of Sacramento Central Committee. He serves as director of Organized Sacramento and was a local leader in Democratic National Convention delegate for Bernie Sanders for president in both 2016 and 2020. And right now he's campaigning for Flo Kofer for mayor of Sacramento. And I really apologize. We're coming toward the end and we're kind of squeezed here. Uh, but we're gonna and we I may request your permission to have us go over a little uh later for our QA. But uh, it's up to the audience if they want to do that. So why don't you go ahead, uh, Eric? And thank you very much, Jasiri. That was so inspiring, uh, what you're talking about in Pittsburgh. That was amazing in Pittsburgh. That's awesome. Our our candidate, uh, well, a little, a little sac. I'll, I'll lay a little Sacramento groundwork. So, uh, so Sacramento, uh, you know, our our unhoused population is is uh, greater per capita than any other uh, city in California. So it's a it's it's the top issue. Um, on everybody's mind, we've done polling. Uh, you know, everybody wants to wants to solve this issue. Everybody has different approaches, right? Um, you know, and for me, it's I, I've been working in the in the electoral space, in the labor space, in the community organizing space for a long time, and and for me, it's just like breaking the status quo, right? We're in Sacramento. Uh, there's a lot of of, of gravity from the capital. Um, there's a lot of, we can't do that. You know, that can't be done. We hear a lot of that. Uh, so like finding a candidate who says, yes, we can, you know, there are, there are different, uh, pots of money that are third rails, you know, that, that everybody's afraid to touch. We need to find people who will, will touch that most, uh, cities and counties, uh, 70% of their, of their budgets are our police law enforcement. So, uh, and nobody, none of our electeds have been 
uh, willing to even mention that. So uh, Flo Kofer, uh, she's a uh, uh, Pittsburgh. She has, shout out Pittsburgh. She was uh, born and raised in Pittsburgh. Uh, she's a, a PhD in entomology, uh, doctor, uh, Flo Kofer, African-American woman, and uh, a progressive. And one of my organizing mentors always told me, you know, like, uh, learn how to count because it's the only thing that counts. So flow won't be uh, a standalone. We've been laying the groundwork uh, to make change in Sacramento. We know we need five votes, a mayor plus four council members. And uh, we're, we're there now with the council now, or we have four council members that we can move on a lot of progressive issues. Um, our mayor is the former uh, Senate pro Tim, Daryl Steinberg, he's leaving. He wants to be the, uh, he wants to be the state cop. Um, so he's running for, uh, for our, our state uh, cop job. And um, we, uh, we, we have a, a great opportunity. Um, we have some, some ex um, council members, assembly people who are running in this race, uh, status quo democrat uh you know moderate to to center moderates and uh flow is 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 a movement builder you know she uh she's gotten the endorsement now i think our revolution just signed on board uh and uh well, it's a working families party she barely missed the democratic party endorsement she was heavily favored the NAACP, she just did an NAACP uh, forum um, and she got 85% of the vote. Um, and that's uh, the, the front runner, Kevin McCarty, former assembly member, is uh, African-American also. So, so that was a, that was an accomplishment there. She is, uh, she is building a, a movement in Sacramento and, and we need this, uh, our housing situation uh we we at one time we had the most progressive inclusionary housing ordinance in the state and that was repealed under mayor kevin johnson uh and 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 replaced with a a fee-based system that has generated uh basically no money uh to build affordable housing we we just did polling in sacramento for a uh, for a measure, uh, a tax measure to to fund affordable housing, and it it did not pull well. Uh, so we need to look for new revenue sources, and we need a, a mayor who's not afraid uh, to to do things differently, to reach into some different pots of money. And uh, flow flow is that person. She understands the connection between health and homelessness as a entomologist she, she she uh she's uh she's amazing so that that is like the big fight in sacramento uh right now we we have gone from uh, my wife and i have worked in in housing homelessness for uh a few decades and uh i think it was maybe 12 to 15 years ago our point in time count was around a thousand maybe 12 1200 unhoused people in sacramento and now we're up over 10,000 um, unhoused people in Sacramento. It is uh, uh, first and foremost on, on, on the um, minds of all voters in Sacramento. So that's, that's, that's the campaign, that's the discussion we're having, um, solutions, policy solutions for, uh, for the unhoused, humane policy solutions for, for uh, housing these folks um, and we're, we're, you know, trying all that stuff on the justice front. We, uh, uh, the, the DA stuff, we also tried to have had tried two cycles to elect, uh, progressive DAs in Sacramento County. And, um, after the last loss, uh, we decided that we needed to move, move our vote. Uh, so we moved the vote from the, from the, gubernatorial cycle onto the presidential cycle in hopes of getting uh, more voters of of folks more you know more of our folks voting poor folks and and uh 
generally the turnout's higher in presidential. So we're hoping that that's going to change some things on the justice front here in Sacramento County. We also had uh, our Sac County, Sacramento County supervisors. They uh, drew their own boundaries uh, to the benefit of, of getting a, a white supremacist elected in uh, in one of our county supervisor seats. So he's a full on Trump support. So so we got a lot of issues in Sacramento. But as far as like making real change in the city of Sacramento, getting those five uh, five votes for uh, progressive change in Sacramento, our focus and the most important thing we got going on right now is uh, Dr. Uh, Flo Kofer's race. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, a lot of great information. Yeah, a lot of great information. I want, I'm trying to put a, a Raman, I'm trying to bring him in, but I wanted to make sure to circle back around on a couple of different things. So first, yes, thank you, Eric. Great, And, and also, uh, Jaziri X, our first time meeting, I thank you so much for your work, your dedication, and also your, um, obviously, um, not just your words, but your words that you know reflect your values. And I thank you for that and for working with this younger generation um, and bringing them into reshaping our country. We talk about this in the Poor People's Campaign as a third reconstruction and a vision about um, the need for a moral revival. So it seems that though we've never been in contact physically before, we maybe have been operating on some of the same principles and, our, and values. So I wanted to make sure just to touch base with that. The other thing I wanted to do since several, this is the beginning of a conversation. I hope it is for all of us because obviously everyone on in, they can hear my voice and I'm thinking about the clubhouse piece knows that you know we are in a hell of a fight um, and we need to figure out how are we gonna organize to stop fascism in this country? Um, we, Arlene and I prepared, we had our little definitions together. You know how things go with these things, um, another time. But one of the things we wanna share and the reason we started with uh, that fight in Oakland is because these billionaires are coming after our tiny little city. You know, we're 400,000 people, right? Uh, we got 5,000 people in the city of Oakland on the streets every day on night. And so we had a very progressive sister elected uh, who has fought on that. And we've also had um, um, this DA who refuses to criminalize our young people. And the month after she was elected, the same billionaires that kicked out Chesa Bodine in San Francisco started organizing to kick her out. They have $500,000 in the war chest to recall her. And she's only been in office for 11 months. So she don't even have a track record, right? Um, this is what we need to understand that when we do put our efforts together through culture, through protests, through ed political education, I happen to work with some of the folks on campuses and someone talked about our, we have a, a huge section of our students at our community colleges are unsheltered. Their cars, if they're lucky, um, is their housing. Um, this is untenable and it does not have to be this way. So one of the things we wanna do is figure out how do we link these efforts and, and, and share lessons about how do we build. We know about Summer Lee. She's big news in this out here in California. We're trying to get our the first elected black uh, senator elected here as well as Flo. So we understand uh, that that role and that value, but we also know we cannot win these things by ourselves and individually. So I don't know if Raman is in the house. If he is, if he could come off mute, I wanted to thank him. Ah, there he is. What? That's you. Um, I know this brother. We're working together for like two decades. I think he used to be a teenager, <laughs> and I used to be young. Uh, so at any rate, I really appreciate his work, and I wanted to make sure to give you a little bit of time to um, say whatever's on your heart and on your mind and what you want us to think about and do going forward. Yeah, I, I so appreciate that, Ethel. And, um, and you know, everybody that's that's here is, uh, it, this is truly inspiring. Uh, like I said, I'm um, really, really, uh, the last time Jasiri and I, we, we connected was actually um, during the Frisco Five protests, um, you know, with the Quipto and, uh, you know, uh, you know, just speaking on, on Hip Hop Congress and, and bringing the worlds of, of our of our culture, of our artists together to sound the drum for 
the general population as you know the it's they say you know it comes through the artists first and the education and the information you know why it's, why it's so important for us to um, support uh, the artists that are that are doing that work, um, which is why I sing praises for Jasiri's long, huge body of work. I mean, it's educational, you know what I mean? Like we should be using it in our schools. We should be, you know, using it as a tool. So, um, you know, I invite everybody to do that. Um, you know, one thing that I wanted to just uh, uh, share relevant to Oakland and, and uh, something that Hip Hop Congress is is working on has to do around the um, the death of uh, an incredible artist who uh, another uh, artist who you should listen to um, from Oakland uh, uh, Zion I uh, the lead frontman for that group uh, is uh, Stephen Gaines uh, his uh, rap name is Baba Zumbi um, and if you look into the circumstances around his death it's uh, it's right. It, 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 we they're trying to sweep it under the rug um you know pamela price is dealing with such a she's dealing with so much that it's like this is one more thing that uh you know on her plate but um uh long story short uh zumbi was who's had been a hip-hop congress artist since the early 2000s um i was one of the first people to bring him down to usc when i was in college um and he toured all of our chapters was our headliner um amazing amazing group um, he was performing in Placer County, and uh, this was over uh, when, uh, well, he contracted, uh, you know, a bunch of people got, uh, got sick from that, um, from that show, um, and uh, he checked himself into Alta Bates Hospital, and uh, uh, something happened where uh, they, uh, he checked in as a 5150, um, the security at the hospital um, uh, basically uh, put him into uh, positional asphyxia, uh, position. He was also asthmatic, and he died um, under security uh, uh, under the security's watch. And um, and you know, so the family has and and he was a huge artist. Like uh, you know, I'll, I'll put again YouTube this and, and a positive artist at that too. I, I will say like um, you know, one of my he 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 was one person that I got to say you know was my favorite artist at the time. Um, and I'm so glad that I, I, I told him that, you know, um, because his body of work is extremely conscious and, and uplifting uh, music, you know, coming out of Oakland. He had, uh, like I said, so uh, uh, I, I want to really call attention to that. One of the things that we're working on, and I'm speaking with uh, his mom, the thing that's been so frustrating about it is that uh, the process, the legal process has been so slow that all of his fans, all of his uh, family and friends like, are like, what can we do? And, um, and so uh, one of the things that we're working on is a memorial, um, a, uh, a statue, a bronze statue that's movable that we can um, house at different areas. Um, and he can essentially continue to tour uh, with, uh, with artist support, with Hip Hop Congress support. Um, his legal team, his lawyer told, uh, uh, I wrote a letter of impact um, because what she informed me about was that um, they're using his financial status. Now he was a popular artist, but he wasn't he wasn't rich by any means or anything like that. And they're using that to try to determine what the the settlement will be. Um, and it's like the kind of thing where it's like, well, unless you can prove that he was, you know, had some sort of uh, you know financial value worth, you know, something like. It's, it's so that's really weird to me. Um, but she requested this letter that she's um, sharing with the DA so that uh, the previous DA did not charge, did not um, press charges. Um, and so the legal team is is uh, is going to go full on if uh, they don't get a response from um, by January 1st, then it's time for us to do a, a campaign and we'll start collecting, you know, through our network, through his fans, uh, all these letters to really just hit it and then um, you know, the goal is to, at, at the very least, um, try to raise money uh, in the name of around 50, 50K uh, to create this memorial that will at least allow us as a community to, to process and heal um, and continue to support his music, which was very much um, a product of the revolution and the movement. So um, I invite everybody to, uh, you know, as we do this work, you know, to, to use the artists to, um, you know, to keep you at a high vibration and to keep you inspired because um, we need that. We need we need more artists like that. And we need the standard of hip hop, you know, in the in the, um, you know, in the in the environment of, uh, you know, so much 
crap out there, um, you know, to, to, uh, you know, to, to elevate the artists that are actually using um, words and lyrics and, uh, and, and uh, uh, language to, to, to push this movement forward. So um, I will put the names of these groups in the chat and these are, uh, uh, yeah, um, on behalf of Hip Hop Congress. Thank you, Robin. And, uh, no, I know. May I just say the connection with a district attorney like Pamela Price is we need to be going, you know, with where the person that was in there for 20 years and who actually oversaw really the wholesale, you know, prison, uh, prison industrial system, you know, you work in it uh, in terms of trying to get young people out of it. And this DA is very different. That's why they're spending so much money and effort to get her out of office. But it's really to get anybody that stands up. So I think we need to link these efforts um, intentionally where we can and, 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 and more, more intentionally and so that we both get those stories out. Uh, I didn't know Zion I, but I'm sure there's a lot of young people who likely do. And those things should help inform our movements. Uh, and we are in a, you know, a battle royal to try and get people uh, who are housing insecure into housing. And um, that's why Carol, because it's not all black women that are the target of these right wingers. That's why we started this with, you need to know there's a campaign to force these leaders out. You need to have that in, uh, you know, in your curriculum in what you discuss and what you share because it is a part of taking back our cities. So I really thank you and I thank Hip Hop Congress for the work that they did uh, making this connection. And I hope that we can all work together on future projects. Um, I think that's a rally article to me, but you, what frankly you and Jaziri just both uh, laid out, but that if we can figure out how to put our heads together and do it, that's the key thing. Yeah, and just one little quick more thing is the, the main thing that they're going to be uh, working towards in the legal case on that is to address the, um, the lack of training for security, um, security companies. Uh, we know that, the, you know, police uh, abuse of power and, and, you know, all of that stuff is, is rampant, but not a lot of focus is on like actual security companies. It was an allied security company um, and they get less training. They get like three hours of training. And so there's an oversight in uh, in that corporate structure that uh, needs to be addressed. So that's going to be a big part of their, their legal uh, uh, case. Thank yeah, you. very important. Thank you. Thank you for all your work. Sorry, thank you, Sandy. Roman. And thank you and to Siri for uh, lifting up the, uh, the role of cultural work in revolutionary organizing, because uh, uh, it's true. It's, it's more than just protesting and it's more than just voting. Um, it's about uh, as the series said, it's about the joy. This is this is something that gives meaning to our lives. Um, we are actually at the end of our time, but I did want to propose for those who are interested, we could extend, we could have a Q&A for another 15 minutes and go until 1.15. Uh, and so if people really don't want to do that, or if panelists have to leave early, uh, let us know and we can stop it uh, now. Uh, but uh, I thought it would be, this, this discussion is so rich that uh, uh, I thought it would be worth trying to continue it for another 15 minutes. Is that acceptable to everybody? Any thumbs up? Any, do I see any thumbs up out there? I gotta find my thumb. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, that sounds good. Uh, I know one question that uh, actually Natalie asked earlier and uh, we never really got to it but it was in the chat it says what does a progressive political push look like and is it possible and i think we're hearing that it is but i think that's that's kind of at the root of what we're talking about because we're we're, we're been talking about this suffering and the, these murders and uh this homelessness and uh, uh not to mention the war but but it's it's uh, it's a it's very grim situation we're facing. We're talking about a candidate for president who says his plan, if he gets elected, is to deport millions of people. Millions. He said millions. That's the term that he used. Millions. His plan is to deport millions of people, and I think we all know what that means uh, for having uh, immigration agencies, and he's planning to recruit military and police agencies to run through our communities and pick people up and make them disappear. So mm -hmm. uh, this is a very serious situation. And uh, 
I just wanted to, uh, and, and actually I'll let Natalie ask her own question. She has her hand up. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. Thank you. This has been very inspiring. So real. I love the real. Um, I think I think my frustration is like, I'm, and we all know, I mean, the two party system. And if we dare go away from that, like everybody's chastised or afraid. And I understand that, too. And it's it feels like it feels like we're stuck. And then like, cool, I have so many like cool people. And, you know, that won't vote. They're not inspired. They're intelligent. They won't vote. And I, I don't know, like, what we do, because I feel like the DNC is going to squash anyone who speaks to people and makes them, you know, want to move and want to vote. And I mean, we are, we're working with young people and getting them excited. But I know this has been like, the question of the ages, you know, how, how do we get people to understand that it matters? And especially like with the school board takeovers, like there's so, so much going on. And like, I ask if it's possible and I hope it's possible, but it's like, I know it's designed the way it's designed. And it's, how do you get people to move together out of that mindset of, you know, the lesser of the two evils to where it could actually work? I don't know. That's my, that's my question though. <laughs> um, if I could, if I could hop in, please, I think a couple of please. things I would say. One, I think like we, what we can do is berate people. Um, and I think that's mm -hmm. kind of like what we've seen, right? Like, oh, you're, you know, my, our ancestors died for you to vote. And it's just like, that doesn't work, you know, instead of like, for mm -hmm. us, it's like voting is an opportunity to build power, right? right. And I think like, right. we talk about, to me, we talk about voting, the, 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 the vote, the, your vote has the most power locally. A lot of times we only show up every four years to talk about voting for an office that you have to have hundreds of millions of dollars to run for. Um, you know, I just was at an event with um, a school board candidate who's a friend in Pittsburgh. Our school board budget is larger than our city's budget, but we'll like um, diminish a school board candidate. We'll like diminish. Are oh, you just a school board? Like we'll diminish that. It's because we really don't understand the power that folks have. And so right. I think like we have to talk to people about like, we talk to it from an aspect of power and we talk about it from an aspect of opportunity. We have an opportunity to build power. Is is our is our liberation going to come from voting? No, right? No. But we have an opportunity to build power or even sometimes people look at it as like harm reduction, right? Um, and so I think we have to be very clear. One, like not beating people, but we have to show people like this is these are the opportunities we can have. I mean, we've kind of been able to build this progressive piece in, in Allegheny County um, which is the county that Pittsburgh is in. One of the reasons, though, that we were able to is because uh, we're not a majority Black city. So we didn't have, like, there wasn't real, a real investment in Black. And, like, there's we don't have a Black middle class. So there's not a Black political middle class, right? <laughs> so our Black candidates were all, like, progressives because, you know, of the level of poverty that we're dealing with. You know, Summer Lee came out of Braddock. If you don't know anything about Braddock, it's one of these places where the steel industry collapsed and nothing... Uh -huh. It, right. Um, and so I think like so we were able to uh, take power in Allegheny County with this whole progressive slate uh, pretty quickly because the, also the established Democrats, they were kind of doing they were used to like not being challenged. And when we challenged them, they, they kind of was like, oh, shit. And it was kind of like too late. You know what I'm saying so I right. think you can, and, and, and say like the last thing I'll say and we and we did it. It actually began with the DSA in Pittsburgh, although, you know, we've had issues with the DSA out here, particularly around race. So, I mean, that's a whole nother right. conversation offline that we can have. Um, the Working Families Party mm -hmm. has had a lot of success in Philadelphia, which is, you know, our, our partner city, right? The Working Families Party just put two people on yeah, no. Philadelphia City Council. And Kendra wow. has so much momentum that she was endorsed by Governor Shapiro. He wow. The Democratic, the Democratic Party in Pennsylvania was like, we can't have any Democrats endorse anybody that wasn't a Democrat. Mm -hmm. he, as the governor of Pennsylvania endorsed Kendra Brooks for yeah. city council as a member of the Working Families Party. That's the mm -hmm. momentum that she had. And then she was able to put our, our brother Nick in 
as another person who's now on the city council. So it can be done even with a different, but it has to be, it's not going to be done immediately. Like it has to be an understanding that these grassroots movements do also take time. Right. Um, and it, and they always start with a few and then they build momentum. And so the working families party have been working in Philadelphia probably for the past eight years. Right. And now they're starting to see those fruits of their labor. So there, that's also a piece. So, we're hoping that the Working Families Party is going to come into Pittsburgh as well. Um, and, and you know, hopefully, you know, we have a Black woman running for attorney general in Pennsylvania. So we're just going to try to keep the momentum going. The last thing I'll say, what we did was we have a series of Black-led political organizations in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County as well, mm -hmm. right? And to collectively work together as black led organizations. And I think that's important as well to have political organizations and invest in political organizations that are led by the black and brown people, led by the people that's most effective. There you go. Affected you go. by those policies. And so I just would throw that in. May I am so glad you are here and so glad for the things that you're raising. Let me just say a couple of things that I would like to extrapolate from that. And that is issue-based, local municipality and issue-based, because then we are we can get past the discussion of simply this party or that party, whatever those entities are. And I think this 2024 election, we need to kind of take a page. You know, now this is on on tape. Digital is forever. Never would say it, but if the Heritage Foundation can publish a thousand paper book that says they don't care which clown gets into the president's seat. They are going to be following a plan in what they call Project 2025 of essentially a fascist government form of, uh, uh, so what they're doing is saying, this is the program that you're running on. This is what people need to adapt. So in our political education, we need to combine those things. And I think the other thing that that says to me is that we need to encourage some of our people going to go, support folks going independent, you know, say um, uh, uh, Brother West or uh, Greens or, you know, um, the progressives. I mean, I love me some, um, what's the young brother from uh, Florida, Maxwell, <laughs> uh, uh, Frost, I mean, you know, and he's definitely in the game. I mean, there are several, the squad that now that uh, APEC has taken out, what is $100 million to knock them out of their seats. What does that mean? I think if we can relay it, because their protection is just like with Summer and others is to the degree that they stood with those communities and defended and advanced what those causes were. That's their real defense. So if we can talk to our, we have found we've talked to our communities about that, there is engagement. That's how we got a Carol. That's how she was frankly recruited <laughs> to run for office. That's not what she had planned to do. She's a community organizer like us on this, on, on this call. That's what she did. But, you know, uh, and I've had conversations with her because she's like, oh, Ethel, this stuff is driving me crazy. I said, I know, but you're there. We need you. And you're not a thief because we've had lots of them, too. So this question, the other thing I would just like to offer is um, probably experience from the Poor People's Campaign. Reverend Barber has a concept because he started as an organizer, right? If, if we could look at getting 30% of the poor, the impacted poor, to in any of these given states, but especially the so-called battleground states, to one, get them registered, to get them engaged where they're actually voting and active on the issues that impact them and their families. That's a big thing that, and and so Jashiri introduced a, con a contradiction. We need time, but we got to hear, right? So it's kind of condensed, but it's also very, very intense, right? It's, this is not this. It, this is not even like 2018. You know, it's 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 focused in a different kind of way, and particularly the younger generation. Um, so, uh, and reproductive freedom. So, those if, if we could think about how do we leverage those aspects and not get people that they gotta oh we gotta go Biden, not scare them and not browbeat them. I really appreciate what you uh, said, but on the other hand, we gotta tell them the importance of this battle for political power and the role they play in it. All right, I'll shut up at that. If I could just jump in real quick to speak to this, and also, I know it's uh, 117, but this just came up on my um, on my Instagram feed. Um, the city of Hayward, or youth in the, in the city of Hayward, just did a rally 
um, a, a ceasefire rally where they are refusing to, you know, they're basically saying not not our tax dollars to fund this war. And nice. get the local uh, council uh, council um, to uh, pretty much like, you know, listen to the people and um, use their use the, um, you know, the economic uh, leverage of tax dollars to, um, you know, to refuse that. I, my question is, is like, is, is that something that we can do and, and what does that look like and and um, you know as a, as a way of of getting our elected officials at the local level to um, stand up for their cities and say you know we support a ceasefire I just wanted to throw that out there because Hayward did that and it was the youth there that did that <laughs> they, people I don't know if he's well you know well well traveled but so Hayward is like right uh, below south of Oakland. And it's like a neighborhood, um, it used to be what we call bedroom city. I think if we can figure out, so in the Poor People's Campaign, we would be saying, bring it in, bring it in. So that's a part of the campaigns that we're doing. And I think this, what I'm you know, hearing from you and Jaziri of thinking about culturally, how do we make the space, in, but don't think about cultural just as you know, flat, but, not, but, but as, as a way to reach people, as a way to elevate the message, as a way to, to spread it and engage. And I think that what they're doing, they're actually advocating for policy. We got to embrace that and we've got to, you know, give that room. And I'm seeing this. Arlene should be on this spotlight. Yeah, I mean, and you know, uh, and I'm like really come thinking on about, now. Uh, get, we have Ray Corona here. on here. We have <laughs> Ray Corona on here who is part of our Youth Advisory Board. And this oh, is wow. what they do. Yeah, okay. Ray has been on here. And oh, that, Ray is this still is here. what they do. I think mm -hmm. they're still here. And that's what they do. They yes. impact what is going on in their communities, in their housing, in their education, in their families, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to really think about how can we help these young people to grow? Because this is National Youth Month. I don't know if any of you guys know that. This is National Youth Month. I'm and young. So is that, is that going to include me? No, I'm just lying. Okay. <laughs> In yeah, spirit. but we we need to we need to lift up and encourage our young people. Like our youth advisory board, everywhere I go, I bring their names up. I brought Ray's name up because they did, right. they are doing tremendous work, and we really need to. We really need. Okay, Miss um, yeah, Natalie. <laughs> yeah, alum, I heard that, Nat, Natalie. Granny's an alumni of the youth. I heard and, that. And, and the biggest thing with them is education. Yes, they are educating themselves on not only what is going on amongst themselves, but about the policies that are impacting them, because that's where the voting is going to happen at. And we need to really think about education. The teachings are marvelous. And go young people, go Ray, go yeah, that's my group. Okay, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I think we need to figure out how to pass this meeting, Raman, because the people she's talking about are part of the Laney College Poor People's Campaign. We've been saying we need to put our heads together either physically or Zoom. Um, and I, I think this sharing this kind of event will be really helpful uh, for people to kind of see uh, that the work is multi-dynamic. Um, but Ray is, a, he is, these are foster, these are adults now who went through the foster care system and basically were homeless. As one brother told me, he said, Miss Ethel, what you're talking about, I've been homeless since I was eight years old. I'm 27 years old now. Um, that's who we try, you know, we got to get them not just, we got to get them, bring them in. Bye, Jazir. I know Bye, you got five minutes. Thank, you. thank you so much. much. Happy, happy gobble gobble to you. <laughs> All right. I know everybody's got to go. We thank uh, you. But, Raman, we got to do this, uh, put this together. Um, and I really especially think Especially the Youth Advisory Board. We just met the person in Haywood or San Leandro with the McKinsey um, uh, oh, right, school right. board. Yeah, when I went to the yeah. event in San Leandro. And we really need to start connecting. Because one of the things I proposed was for them to do an event with just young people to educate yeah, them. Yeah, all of that. All of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. People should drop their uh, email and contact information in our chat. That way, for people we don't know, like I'm not sure where Natalie's from. I don't know if she's from California or some other part of the country. And Eric, you know, we're talkers. You better jump in here. You didn't seem like you were too shy. <laughs> Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Yeah. Did you want to say anything else, Eric, about Miss Flo or anything like that? Well, you know, it's it, obviously take back our cities. We we 
and I I have to agree with everything everybody was saying as far as like it's a long process. You know, we've been fighting this fight for a long time. It takes a long time because it's not just one vote. You know, it's five. We got to get five votes to get anything done in That's Sacramento. Right. Uh, we've been we've been fighting that fight and and also like um, finding solutions. Like if something doesn't work, then we try so. That's why we moved the the DA election. We got tired of losing these DA fights, and uh, we started looking at numbers. And so we moved the DA election off the gubernatorial to the presidential. Good uh, California Good. for the whole state. That right. Was a deal. Uh, but yeah, as far as as far as sac- I mean, I I, I kind of feel like we're at a tipping point in a lot of cities. You know, as yeah. far as as far as our Sacramento being the worst as far as uh unhoused people people struggling the uh epidemic pushed a lot of folks who were flexible from the bay area into sacramento and drove right. drove, drove our rents and and housing costs up because people were able to telecommute and whatnot and they're like i can get a whole lot more house in sacramento but they're bringing bay area money so it, it really had a huge, huge impact. And it's very uh, fluid, isn't it? It's very fluid, this thing, how it moves. It's just like those who are unhoused in encampments. They close down an encampment. Yeah. It's fluid. They move to another place. And it's just like housing. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, you're just, it's like you're moving the, you know, moving your food around on the plate. You don't want to eat it. That's what that's, yeah. that's, that's been the status quo policy of all these cities. Like, Oh, whoever the loudest voices are, are going to push these encampments out of their neighborhoods and they get pushed into another neighborhood. So well, yeah. that's why I think yeah. we didn't even policy. get to the social housing discussion, to, but I think that could be a future one yes. because what mm-hmm. we're, I mean, Carol is doing uh, spearheading around this. I think we got to figure out how do we link on the grassroots level and how do we link, you know, with efforts such as flows and, you know, and, and Carol, but because Carol and, was a firebrand by herself for a long time, but she, when she was able to move that, those policies to be voted on by the city, you know, the difference that made Eric, that made it be from, okay, yes, she is crazy. Yes, she is a firebrand. Yes, she's crazy on about justice and she's on fire about that. And then it was, then 75% of the public voted for the for those initiatives. For those measures, yes. Those, those three measures. measures. And I spoke, I met Sandy over social housing, community land trust, uh, uh, TOPA. And so we really need to think about how we can change because we, we think about housing a certain way and we have to mm-hmm. learn how to uh, be, be trained to think about housing differently because yep. until we do, and until we begin to deal with it differently, not only the way we think about it, but the way that we allocate resources and funds. So I see now who Natalie is. So if we can make sure we put that contact information in there. Liz is, um, I'm Liz and Sandy, uh, period, they are just like a treasure trove of information around social housing. And she uh, can be quiet, but it still water runs deep. And we need to tap those things, especially as we think about what does revolutionary transformation mean? This is so crucial to the work that we're doing. And, um, but that's why I said, we need to see this as a beginning kind of meeting, not an end. Even though we have to end this, because some of us got another meeting in 30 minutes. (laughs) Yeah, but you know, like Desiree, I'm just going to say this. Desiree said something really prolific about that Title VI. And I've been thinking about the monies that are sitting somewhere that we could be utilizing to finance our agenda and we sure. have to begin to think about that way that my, in my Absolutely. former life i was a, you know i was in corporate america in accounting so i always counted the, the 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 pennies okay or the dollars so we need to begin to think differently about where we're going to get the funding to move our agenda forward and also the not only the people but our agenda because yes. we have to fund yeah. it and so these components are also the movement itself so yes. just so everybody knows I know y'all are on this list. And uh, next time when somebody says, well, why a, Benet, a league Benet meeting in the middle of all these protests? You'll be like, because that's where uh, the peoples is going to get the education and the strategy we need to kick some butt and take some names. That's yeah. what these meetings are about.